You're listening to the Mindful Mama podcast, episode 105. Today, we're talking about available parenting in the long term with Dr. John Duffy. Welcome to the Mindful Mama podcast. Here, it's about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. And Mindful Mama, we know that you cannot give what you do not have. And when you are thriving, when you have calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm your host, Hunter Clark Fields, Mindful Mama Mentor. I coach overstressed moms on how to cultivate self-awareness in their daily lives and to take family and life to a new level of peace and cooperation. I've been practicing yoga and mindfulness for over 20 years. I'm the creator of the Mindful Parenting Course, and I'm the mom of two girls. Thank you for being here today, my friend. I'm so excited to share this conversation with you. I love talking to Dr. John Duffy, and if you want to get some perspective today, you are absolutely going to get it. Dr. John Duffy is a highly sought-after clinical psychologist, best-selling author, certified life coach, parenting and relationship expert, and proud husband and father. He has been working with individuals, couples, teens, and families for nearly 20 years. And if you're in Chicago, you might hear recognize his voice because he's on the radio there in Chicago all the time. Along with his clinical work, Dr. Duffy is the author of the number one best-selling, The Available Parent, and we're going to talk about that. He's been on the Today Show, on Fox News, Steve Harvey, etc., Real Simple Magazine, and he's a nationally recognized expert in self-awareness, relationships, and parenting. So I can't wait for you to hear Dr. John Duffy and what he has to say. It really gave me so much perspective. We talk about why there's this myth that we think teenagers are going to be awful. We talk about what's wrong with punishment and why natural consequences put you in a more powerful position. We also talk about John's personal story about of why expectations and perfection don't work. So I cannot wait for you to hear this episode, my friend. And before we do, I just want to give a shout out to Kristen Began and Christy V and Utah Taylor for the five-star iTunes reviews. Thank you so much, you guys. Oh my gosh, we're getting closer to 100. I love it. Utah writes so beautifully. She says, every time I listen to a Mindful Mama podcast, I feel motivated and reassured. I have recommended these podcasts to many mothers and even my friends who are not mothers. Much of the information is applicable to any person. When the end of the podcast is near, I get sad. I never wanted to end. Oh my gosh, Utah, that is so, so sweet. Oh, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate that wonderful, wonderful review. Thank you. And I hope you will join me and hopefully Utah will join me and the listener, please join me (laughs) for, we have some special event coming up. I am doing a free live mindful parenting training week coming up on March. It's March 5th through 9th, and you can learn more about it at mindfulparentingcourse.com slash free training, and you can just go there and sign up for it, and you can check it out. People have gotten so much out of this free training. I've had people say, I definitely recommend this training to others. You've got nothing to lose and everything to gain. That's what Natalie said. So I hope you'll join us. That's coming up, and it's at mindfulparentingcourse.com slash free training. And now, on to this episode with Dr. John Duffy. John Duffy, thank you so much for coming on the Mindful Mama podcast. I'm so glad you're here today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here talking to you. Yeah. And of course, I've heard you speak and I've listened to your work and your words. And you have, you're a psychologist, you're an author, you're a speaker, you've done a lot of different things. And I'm wondering about, we've written the book, The Available Parent. I'm wondering how you got interested in parenting as a topic that was fascinating you more to begin with. I mean, was it just having your first kids or were you interested in it before then? No, to be really honest with you, Hunter, when I finished my doctorate, I was interested in working with high-functioning adults. I was going to make my career nice and easy, (laughs) and I was not interested in parenting. (laughs) Um, And my first referrals happened to be from a high school in the area where I live, and I was so not interested in working with teenagers, with kids. And 
I just fell in love with these kids immediately when I started working with them. And I found this just strictly, honestly, by accident, found this niche that has been my kind of now passion for 23 years <laughs> since I first started working with them. And the themes, we'll get into this, I'm sure, as, as we go forward, but the themes that I see taking place in families between parents and kids are so consistent. That's why I ended up writing a book about it. But ever since those first referrals started flooding in, I was very, very interested in parenting. I was hooked on the idea of being the best parents we could be, being as mindful and present with our kids as we could be. But it was not deliberate. It was strictly by accident. <laughs> Yeah, I'm curious, you know, I wonder if some of those fears maybe that you had about like working with teens are some of like stem from some of the same fears, I think, that drive parents to maybe parent not in like the most skillful way. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that's spot on. My anxiety about working with teenagers, why I had decided many years ago not to, is I thought they were going to be difficult. I thought they were going to be uh, cagey. and I wasn't going to be able to get through to them. I thought they were going to be just these riddles that were unsolvable, you know? So I really was carrying around the mythology that I think a lot of us carry about our kids as they kind of approach the teenage years, that this is going to be awful. <laughs> and that's really what I was worried about is this is going to be just awful, awful work and we're never really going to get anywhere. And my career has proven to, to play out so differently than that, that it's been just this great joy and just on a personal note, I do have a child. He's 22 now. So he was young when I started my work. And I'm so grateful to have known teenagers before he was a teenager because, <laughs> because our connection was, was just lovely all the way through. You know, we really never had that moment that we think is inevitable between parents and teens. George and I never had this moment where we were in great conflict. We never had this moment where he was sullen or locked in his room. You know, we, we were able to keep the kind of flow of communication going in part because I learned from so many kids how to do that and that that's what they really want in their lives. Mm, wow, well, so this is exciting to me, John, as a <laughs> parent of a 10-year-old and a 7-year-old. And yeah. one of the things that has driven me and my husband in large part to learn about how to change our communication patterns and to communicate more skillfully and not communicate in such a way that causes resentment and resistance in our children is the teenage years. Like this is my hope and my sort of torch that I hold <laughs> guiding the way <laughs> is that if we can communicate in such a way that and have a strong connection and be real and avoid some of those pitfalls, then we can have this strong connection. And I really think that teenagers and adolescents, like they don't really rebel against their parents. They rebel against the way the discipline or the authoritarianship or, or whatever, the way that their parents treat them. I mean, I don't know. Do you agree? I agree completely. And that kind of authoritarian nature I think it confuses a lot of us parents because a lot of us were brought up under authoritarian household regimes. You know, I, I personally was. And, you know, that, that fear of my parents, that little, little tinge of fear actually probably served them well. That kind of worked for my generation. Mm -hmm. But kids today are smarter, you know, and they're savvier. And, and I think part of it is that they have technology at such an early age and they're exposed to so many things in the world at an earlier age. And I think it's a better story not to parent from this authoritarian space, but rather to kind of put our fear and our judgment and our ego aside and really connect and hold on to the connection that we have when our kids are younger, like your children, you know, in, in that 8, 9, 10, 11 space. And then that resentment and resistance may never really come along because you're not parenting from the spot of fear. And a lot of us parent from fear just because. We want our kids to thrive and be happy and successful, but sometimes we're working against ourselves when we try to do that with an iron fist instead of an open line of communication, kind of trusting our parenting and trusting our kids that they can, they can navigate the world maybe a little better than we think. So let's go back a little bit, John, and I invite you to think about when you were raised by your parents and then you yeah. started to work with these teenagers 
and you're parenting your young son and you're learning a lot. And what did you learn? Granted that, you know, it's a given that your parents were doing the best they could and with the tools that they had, just as mine were and all and the listeners were, but what did you learn about what wasn't working and why was it not working? And what, what didn't work when you were a kid? Hunter, that is such a great question. I like to think that myself and we therapists have this great insight into ourselves. As I finished, I remember as I, I was finishing writing my book, The Available Parents, I thought in the book, I tell vignettes and stories about my client families. By the time the book was over, I realized, oh, this is my story. <laughs> this is my story. I'm just not telling it directly. And it really was about how I was raised. And I agree with you. I think as parents, we all do our best. We all try to raise the most happy, successful kids that we can. But I think some of us just get really frustrated when things don't work the way we plan them to. And we kind of clamp down instead of easing up a little bit. But I was in a clamp down kind of household. We had these very clear expectations of the way we were going to be. And the Duffies were expected to be very close to perfect. And some of us kind of fell in line with that, my older brother and I. And some of us kind of fell off that line a little bit, my other siblings. And I would argue it didn't work beautifully for any of us because my older brother and I were very anxious men. You know, like I grew up a pretty anxious guy and I didn't recognize that in real time. So I, you know, kind of thought, oh, geez, I'm just suffering this thing and I don't know what it is or how to get past it. And this is just my lot in life. Not having any idea that this is kind of the culture of my family and my, my parents that is driving this feeling in me. And my other siblings kind of opted out, I think almost wisely, like they decided, oh, I'm going to be far from perfect. I'm going to be the trouble, <laughs> um, in part because they might have seen the anxiety that we were going through and decided, you know, what? I don't want to feel that way. I don't think I've got it in me to really manage that feeling. And so a lot of my work has been inspired by what worked and didn't work in my household growing up. And a lot of it was that I felt kind of disconnected from my parents and just like I wanted to please them. But in pleasing them, I never really figured out who I was, who I wanted to be, nor did I feel comfortable in my skin, you know? So I had to kind of get some breathing space from them as an adult in order to recognize, oh, I'm not the accountant that they raised <laughs> and <laughs> encouraged me to be. And I was an accountant for several years. <laughs> I actually have a completely different set of skills and acumen and interests. And, but I didn't know any of that growing up because I was just trying to be good enough. And so that's, that's something I really emphasize in my work with families is the starting point for any parent is your child is good enough. And that's a given whether he or she is doing their homework or going to school or engaging in some reckless behavior or not, no matter what, your child is good enough and you've got to parent from that perspective. Their behavior is another issue. And if they're quote unquote misbehaving, then it's important to look into, well, what's underneath that? I'm not just looking, I don't have a bad seed because I don't believe there's such a thing. So what's underneath that? And what am I missing in my parenting that I can shift a little bit in order to facilitate the the ease and growth of my child if that makes sense yeah yeah like when somebody's acting badly they're feeling badly so what's going on exactly. you know exactly underneath that yes wow wow so yeah that whole idea of perfection that can be so hard i mean you're never good enough when perfection is the is right. the model never right. you never meet that and it's more and more you know i've been doing this for a couple of decades and more and more that is the metric because Oh, yeah, because the stakes so much are so much higher. Yes, yeah. the stakes are so much higher. And we expect our kids to do so well. And we think that if they're not in the top 10% of their class and they're not involved in all these clubs and groups and sports and activities, that they're just not going to make it, whatever that means. This is really interesting because so I teach mindful parenting. It's an eight-week course and it's come up, the question of homework has come up in our, in our course a couple of different times. Sure. And so I've talked to a mom of a daughter who's in eighth grade and I suggested this idea to her. I said, just try this idea on for side. I said, what if homework were not your problem, but what if homework were your child's problem, you know, your daughter's problem rather than your problem? And this was a radically difficult concept to accept, like it wasn't acceptable. And I wonder what, what you think about that. What do you think about letting kids sort of own some of their problems in this way? 
It's critical. It's so hard for parents to do, Hunter. I'm laughing because <laughs> my last session last night was about this very issue. <laughs> and, I mean, it was a mom and it happened to be your son, but really she's like, you know, where is my line? You know, how hard do I need to push or should I back off, back out all the way and let natural consequences fall? But I'm afraid to do that because if I let natural consequences fall, Will he make it? Will he get into the schools he wants to get into? Will he be disappointed? Will he be mad at me if I don't push him? So I think it's a really tricky parenting question. Yeah, these but are good this, questions. Right. But this is the time, you know, when, when our kids are in our home to let them fail, let them make mistakes, let them stumble and figure it out. And I selected that word available in the title of my book with a lot of care. And I got so much pushback from my publisher <laughs> saying, nobody knows what that means. Nobody's going to be interested in what, <laughs> what the available parent is. The idea behind it is that you are there. You're available as an ally and a guide and a consultant. In other words, if you need me, you let me know, but you are in charge. So your homework is yours. I am here if you need me, but you need to let me know. Otherwise, whatever happens, good or bad, is your issue. You know, and, and I think that bolsters a child's sense of competence and resilience. And, you know, because they have this idea that, oh, mom and dad have faith in me. There's confidence in me. They believe that I am capable of managing the world on my own to a great extent. Maybe not entirely because if health and safety are an issue, I think we need to be more involved as parents. But with things like homework, I think it's important to say, okay, this is your job. I've already gone through school. I've done my homework. It's your job, but I am here if you need me. And I think that's an important skill for kids to kind of learn too, is like to ask for help when they need it. And I, but I always find that show of confidence in them to be a really useful kind of self-worth building tool that parents do not use often enough because they're afraid their kids are not going to rise to that occasion. More often than not, if you really kind of step back and really let them own it, then I think you see positive results almost all the time. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your words on this because, I, yeah, I think it's just about this idea of trust. And it's interesting because we can practice it maybe or not practice it all along the way. Like I'm thinking about like, huh, do I trust my seven-year-old to actually get her stuff together in the morning? <laughs> without bugging her relentlessly, right? Right. And that's right. kind of where it starts is like, do we trust them to to get to that point? So you, you're you talking about like kind of letting the natural consequences happen. I mean, you know, I, I have to tell you, John, I remember when my girls were little, sending them to school to their, you know, preschool, here's their toothbrush. <laughs> here's a little baggie with their clothes <laughs> that they wouldn't put on. You know, it's a little embarrassing, but have fun. They got dressed after that. They took responsibility for that thing. So how can we, I mean, how do you work with parents to, I mean, how can parents shift into this place of trusting their kids? And and I want to kind of talk about how do we, can we shift to this place of trusting our kids? But while we're on this idea also of natural consequences and things like that, from your point of view as a psychologist and the work you've done and maybe any research, is punishment effective? Yeah, all good and important issues. All right, so let's start with trust and natural consequences. Okay. I, I love the idea of natural consequences. There's so much more usable and handy than consequences that we impose. I'm working with, with a young man right now. He is going to be the most amazing lawyer one day because he is so deft at saying, the punishment doesn't fit the crime here. And he will argue the consequences that his parents bring up to death. In the end, the parents are punishing themselves because he will spend hours delineating like, well, last time I did this, all you had me do, you know, I was, I was only grounded for a couple of hours, you know, and now you're saying I'm grounded all weekend. Help me understand where that makes sense, mom, you know? Oh my God, I'm laughing because that is so me. Oh my God. Is that right? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> in a way, I'm kind of really impressed with his, his skill and his memory bank. And he's really, really deft at this, really clever. And so to, to step back and let the natural consequences fall, you know, if a teacher says, okay, well, you know, I'm not going to let you do that homework assignment over. There is so much more power in that, you know, because it's like, we didn't make this up. This is what the real world is bringing to you. And now, you know, you know, and so we might not even pile on here. We might not have any consequence, 
on top of that, what we might do is just like take a moment and talk about like, okay, so what happened there? Well, I didn't, didn't do my homework last night and now I'm not going to get, I lose that 10 points of credit. All right. So what's the takeaway here? I guess I got to do it. You know, like <laughs> it's kind of very simple and it kind of puts you in this more powerful ally position than if you're kind of like trying to jerry rig a set of consequences to kind of like punish your kids. So getting to your idea of punishment in my book, I say, you know, like if you feel the need based on the way you were parented or based on some deep belief system to punish your child for some misdeed, feel free, but it's not going to get you anywhere. Not with kids these days. It's not going to endear you to them in any way which isn't the sole goal of parenting, but it's not unimportant. It won't foster an alliance. And in all likelihood, if they've done something that is that goes against your ethic, your moral compass, or what you want for them, what you really deep down want for them, then they're probably paying the price anyway. You know, I think uh, by and large, kids run into natural consequences when they do something that isn't in keeping with what you know, you've taught them to do. So I'm not a big fan of punishment. I don't think it's particularly useful. I've been doing this for a couple of decades. I don't think I have the most popular view on this, but I honestly cannot think of a single time where I thought just straight punishment is useful. I always like to look at even egregious behavior as an opportunity to deepen a connection, always. So I'm working with a family right now where this teenage daughter drank too much on New Year's Eve. And this is not unusual, but you know, the parents were very, very upset, but with great mindfulness, this mom who really initially thought, you know, like she is on lockdown, <laughs> you know, like she is grounded for 2018, you know, that was her initial impulse. And then she kind of like was, she describes a scene where she's laying with her daughter who is sick as a dog, New Year's Eve. And she realizes, oh, I think she might need me. Like, I think, I think I'm going to spend tomorrow just taking care of her, connecting with her. And then the next day, I'll just talk to her about like, what, what happened here? What went wrong? And how do you feel about it? And so she kind of drew her into this conversation. And, you know, and this girl had a great deal of remorse and, and she felt terrible about it. And she felt terrible physically and she was scared. And the mom realized, I don't know if I ever would have gotten to, I'm really scared, mom. Like this scared me a lot. And, you know, I might need your help here. I don't know if I would have gotten there if I just like laid down the law, you know, like we wouldn't have had this kind of really meaningful talk about like what substance abuse is all about and how dangerous it can be, you know? And so she saw the opportunity and she took it. I think that that is always a better story than, than just laying down a punishment because that's kind of a, a final answer and it doesn't foster that communication. And I always think about parenting as what's the better story here? What's the better story you can write in this moment? And if you can be mindful, and I suddenly love the name of your podcast, <laughs> if you can be mindful in a moment, even in a really difficult parenting moment, the better story is almost always going to be to take a, to take a breath, mm -hmm. relax, recognize, okay, nothing catastrophic is happening here. What's happening here is, is a parenting opportunity. And if you can take advantage of that opportunity, then I think you deepen your connection and the trust that you have with one another. And just as easily, if you just lay down the law and lecture and yell and come up with punishment, you can drive a wedge deep between yourself and your teenager. And both of those approaches come from the best of intentions. But I think taking that beat and reminding yourself, like, what's my goal here? My goal here is not just to punish my kid. My goal here is that they have some takeaway from this. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to breathe, relax, and connect. And I always think that's a better story. Oh, yeah, definitely. And I love your, I love your story of this mom because there's no hurry, right? Like that's where we get into all our worst parenting is when we're reactive and we feel like we have to do something right now. Instead, she waited a whole day and a night, maybe, you know, I mean, that's, yes. that can feel like an eternity when you're like, <laughs> I have to have some response to this situation. But that was very skillful, was yeah. to just 
pause and yeah, and breathe and kind of sit with, oh my gosh, this is scary. This is uncomfortable. What's going on for all the things that are coming up in this mom's mind about, well, you know, there's all that thinking that this is the way life is forever and ever and ever after this, you know, yes, and, yes, right. and just getting into this, relaxing back into this place of, okay, instead of judgment let me move towards curiosity what really is going on here what really is going on for my daughter and how beautiful to, to then take this thing that could have been a wedge to drive i mean i don't know i mean there's so many people who have really sad really uncomfortable relationships with their parents like adults who have very uncomfortable relationships with their parents for the rest of their lives and like not very close because of the wedges that were driven in at those times that and, is um Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, but no, that, no, go that, ahead. That is, that is kind of the punchline. Whenever I'm addressing a group of parents, I always encourage them to think about the long game. Like I always figure, you know, like I want to remind people that you're not just like kind of establishing this relationship for now to kind of grit through these awful teen years. <laughs> no, it's like you want to have a great relationship because, because teenagers are so cool, so smart, so thoughtful, amazing people. And I have this unusual job, Hunter, where I get to sit with them for hours a day and kind of marvel at them in awe. And I realize so often that the kid that I'm talking to, their parents might not know this side of this person at all. They might just see the worst, the darkest of them, because that's what they're inviting, you know? And it feels like such a ripoff, <laughs> you know? And so I always want parents to kind of replace that you know replace me in that scenario and be the one who can like look on with their kids in awe and really recognize just i loved your words that there is no hurry that in all likelihood the situation you're dealing with even the situation on new year's eve it's a crucial situation it's important to address it properly but if you address it like it's a crisis then you're in a hurry and then you're probably going to make some regrettable misstep that you might not even be aware of because you know you don't take that beat of self-awareness and if you recognize there is no hurry let's not call this a crisis this is a parenting situation and i'm going to address it like i address other parenting situations and not put my child in the bad kid misbehaving oh my gosh we've jumped the shark here category <laughs> but just be like okay that was a misstep there's an opportunity here you know like so i've got to find that opportunity and i'm going to need to step away for a moment to figure out what that is because my initial impulse is one of this deep fear which is the first thing this mom felt naturally and really think about how i want to approach this and you know and that provides you that space to find the opportunity and the connection and think about like, well, 20 years from now, I want this child to come home and share Thanksgiving dinner with me, not because they have to and they want to get out as fast as they can, but because we're still connected the way we were 20 years before. Yes. And you know, I think it's really hard to put those connections together after a really rough eight yeah. years as teenagers, you know? Yeah. Oh my goodness. I won't go there, but there were wooden spoons involved. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> and I wanted to just point out to the listener, like we're talking about this story with a mom and her teenager who drank too much on New Year's, but this is same exact principles apply to your toddler who hit his little sister, whatever, you know, when can take a moment to pause and not see their mistakes as evidence of their, you know, the, some, some horrible, you know, but just see them, their mistakes as let them have their mistakes, let them be human, yes. love them anyway. The definition of unconditional love is loving them without the condition that they have to be good to love them, right? So we love them anyway. I find myself golf clapping, but I, am, <laughs> I applaud that, Hunter, like you wouldn't believe that's exactly right. I almost regret writing toward parents of just teens and tweens because you're right these principles apply to your very youngest child and the earlier you apply them on a regular basis you get into this practice mm -hmm. of mindful available present parenting and then once the teenage years are upon you i think that fear is diminished maybe not gone because i think it's an anxious time i can remember a couple of times with my son where like a grade wasn't where i wanted it to be and i had this like press this internal inclination to like okay i've got to bear down on this guy <laughs> and just having been practicing all of this for 14 years at that point i was able to breathe through it and find that 
that presence of mind and that self-awareness of like, you know, wait a minute, is this my thing that I'm bringing to him or is it his? And I realized, oh yeah, that's, that's mine. And that happened to me a number of times when he was a teenager, you know, like, okay, step back and recognize what I need to own and recognize what's his. And 99% of the time it was my thing to own, you know, that strong kind of like reactive moment. Yeah. So you write about the available parent and it's interesting with that word, you know, because for parents of young children that can feel, I want to ask you how we can connect more with our teenagers, but I also want to Mm -hmm. ask you about this idea of this availability because I think especially for moms of young children, there can be a pressure that they should be like physically available all the time for their kids. Yes, yes. And, and so I just wanted you to maybe speak to that too, because that's like there, I, anyway, speak to that if you would. Yes, do. no, that's a great point. And I was asked recently, I did a talk, I was in New York, I was talking to a group of parents at American Express and this mom said, you're making me feel so guilty <laughs> about, <laughs> about parenting my kids. I mean, I'm here at work and I'm not with them. And sometimes when they're playing in the park, I'm on my phone doing some work things or looking at, you know, Facebook or something. Am I doing it wrong? And my press is, you know, no, like the, by and large, I think what I'm looking for from parents is if you're available, you specifically don't have to be there all the time. Your child just knows fundamentally from the way you relate to him or her that should they need you, you are there. But I think available parents spend less time with their kids than hovering helicopter tiger parent where you know we're trying to kind of micromanage their lives and make them a certain way i think that is brutal on the parent and the child i think it's really hard to be over involved in your child's life and trying to kind of dictate and script out how your child's life is going to play out moment to moment day to day and then long game year to year you know like i i have this vision for who i want him or her to be when they grow up and i'm going to kind of like keep them in that lane instead of stepping way back, spending less time trying to manage their lives, marvel at them, be present for them, and and really kind of be in awe of like who they develop to be and kind of like almost look at yourself as an observer. There's a, a little vignette in the book that a mom actually introduced me to where she said, my teenager, every once in a while, I just go into the room where she is and I'll just watch her. And I'll try to marvel at her like I marveled when she was a newborn, you know, like look at her hands, you know, look at her fingers, look at her eyes, you know, look how beautiful she is. Look at her kind of just, even if she's on her phone or watching TV, just like, you know, just look at her demeanor. And she just found this kind of like this love for her that put all the fear aside. And so I encourage all parents to kind of like take these moments pretty frequently to even your most you know, wildly misbehaving teen or tween or five-year-old to just take a moment and just watch them and find the joy because it's there. You know, If you can put fear and judgment and ego away, then you'll be like, wow, what an amazing human being. Can't wait to see what they choose to do with their lives. And I'm so excited to bear witness to it, but I don't need to be there for every bit of it because if I am, then I'm overdoing it. I'm micromanaging it and I'm not allowing them to the space to figure out who they are. And that's kind of what I was hinting at is how I was parented. I don't think I was allowed that space to figure it out. So in my late twenties, I had to do a lot of dancing to figure out and spend a lot of money on graduate school (laughs) to figure out, you know, who I was and who I wanted to be. So to your point, I think less time, but more, more kind of directed time toward enjoying and connecting and problem solving together. That's what I'm looking for from parents. Not that you're available 24-7. I think that defeats the purpose entirely. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. I think sometimes we, when kids are little, you know, we think, okay, I'll play blocks with you for 10 minutes or I will suffer. (laughs) Actually, I will not suffer through Candyland. Oh my God, that's so impossibly mind-bogglingly driving me crazy. But anyway, (laughs) (laughs) we can see the ways to connect with our little kids. Like we can snuggle, we can cuddle, like that physical connection is really important. And then as kids get older, they're stepping away physically. They may want more physical space. So then how do we connect when our kids start to get into the teens and tweens? Great question. So 
I feel compelled to share one other story. I worked with parents recently who were upset with themselves. They have several kids, and I think the oldest is 16 and the youngest is seven. And they wanted an hour-long family meeting every Sunday, and their kids just wouldn't abide by it. And they were so mad at themselves. And I thought, you cannot be mad at yourselves for that. That's an absurd thing to want to have. (laughs) Today, connection doesn't require an hour-long meeting. It might, for teenagers, sometimes you just get moments. You get a few moments in the car. You might get a few moments at dinner. You might have a show that you like to watch together, or if you can if you can stand their music, like listen to their music with them and really kind of get into it. And if you can't stand it, ask them like, what do you love so much about it? Because I can't stand it, you know? (laughs) But find those moments to connect. It doesn't have to be constant. But I think, you know, I love the idea of kind of like checking in once a day. And not just like, how was your day? But, you know, like sitting down with them, you know, like, hey, how's it going? And protecting, let them know that they're important enough to you that you're going to put your agenda aside, whatever you've got going on, whether it's getting the house ready for something, whether it's work that's got to be done, emails that need to be answered, and put all that aside, put all the screens aside, and just sit with them for a moment. And they might be like, what do you want? You know, (laughs) it might feel a little inorganic, especially at first, but if you hang in there, you'll have these moments that are kind of connecting where, you know, most every teen and tween age kid has this moment of the day where they regress. Oftentimes it's right when they go to bed where they want to snuggle a little bit, where they want to talk a little bit. I just encourage parents to look for those moments, those gentle moments with your kid. And sometimes it's in the car. Sometimes it's after a bad game or a rough dance rehearsal or a bad day at school. And just encourage them to like share their story. Or if they're not interested in doing that, just like, I'm really sorry things didn't go well today. Let me know if there's anything I can do. And just take that moment, you know, but but to expect like, okay, we're going to have a very long talk, mister, about what's going on in your life. Those days are kind of gone. You know, kids work in sound bites now. Their lives are, they move fast. And if you think about, I don't know how familiar you are with Snapchat, but you know, the kids I work with, they're all on Snapchat. And what is, can't... I have no idea. Like this is not in my world at all, but I've okay. heard of it. So what is Snapchat? So, so Snapchat <laughs> is a social media platform. And most parents would argue, uh, parents of teenagers, that it is specifically designed to drive parents crazy because you can send a quick like um, picture with a message across it to a friend of yours and then it disappears. You know, it's just gone from the <laughs> so you can't stop it. Uh, it's it's magic. The, the, de- the self-destructing note. Like I remember, exactly. oh my God, I have to tell you. It's like the other night, I don't know, my daughter showed me a note that they had, it was a for a friend of hers. And wow. I just, it like came back to me and I completely taught them how to like fold a note into the tiny little triangle. <laughs> I used to tell them. I was like, here, this is important knowledge that should be passed on to the next right, generation. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny what we what we decide to pass on to our kids. I think that's great. <laughs> okay. So so that's what Snapchat is. It's this quick little thing that, that kids just love for different reasons. You know, some kids love it because they can like send something really funny to their friends. Some kids love it because my parents, even if they take my phone at the end of the night, they can't track every single thing I've done. And so I can send something private to a friend of mine. And sometimes that alarms parents. But but it works so fast. So sometimes I will just take a two minute break in between sessions and I will come in and there's a teenager on my couch here in my office and they will have sent a dozen Snapchats to friends, like really quick messages. And so they work that fast. Like they kind of like, they operate on that kind of rapid fire scale. And so to expect that, you know, you're gonna be able to slow down their mind so much to take this long meeting with them probably is not particularly realistic. One cool thing I will share with you is a lot of the kids that I work with, along with having things like Snapchat, have like Headspace or a meditation app on their phone as well, because they recognize like a lot of them kind of intuitively recognize I'm getting anxious from this thing. And so I need something to calm me down. And it's derivative from the thing as well. But it's kind of interesting to see that instinct come from them. Like they, there was a boy in here a couple of days ago and, and he downloaded Headspace and he's been doing these daily meditations with no heeding from myself or his parents or anybody else. He just realized, yeah, I'm kind of like, I'm a wigging out is what he said. (laughs) I'm wigging out and I need to calm down once in a while. And those couple minutes a day really helped me. Ah, oh, that's beautiful. Um, thanks so much for sharing that. I was starting to get anxious about this whole 
<laughs> um, it made me think of, I, before we go, and I want to respect your time, but I mean, I feel like there's so many things I could talk to you about, but I do want to talk about, because it's something we don't bring up very often on this podcast is the needs of boys versus the needs of girls. But what you said about the Snapchat and the speed at which kids are going, and it makes me think of modeling, right? Like, we are going so fast. Like so many of us are always distracted and always on our phone. Would you say that modeling, taking, being mindful of our screens and and being conscious of taking breaks from our screens and maybe talking about that in the family can help the inundation of the technology and the problems that comes with that for kids and teens? It's the only thing I think that helps. If they see that we are willing to put that screen down for a while a day. And a lot of us aren't. A lot of us, like, we don't have full awareness of how much those machines own us. And then we expect our kids to do something different than they've been taught. Not directly. We haven't said, like, spend a lot of time on your phone. But if we do it, we are teaching them that, no matter what our words say. So modeling is so much more potent than lecturing, you know, which is what the trap I find that so many parents fall into. And kids today are not really open to lectures. But modeling goes an awful long way. And you don't even have to really say anything. If you are on your phone a lot less than you used to be, if you consciously make a decision like, you know, okay, I, I'm not modeling a very healthy lifestyle. And it's no small thing, Hunter. I don't know if you, um, there was a piece in the Atlantic that took my breath away. I've known for years that too much time on screens is unhealthy for kids. But this piece was described a really solid piece of research that suggested that the tipping point for anxiety, depression, attention issues, and suicidal ideation was only two hours a day, which seems like a long time. But I think about not just the kids I work with, but the adults I work with. Two hours on a screen is most of us spend a lot more than that. Yeah. And so like, there is a degree of urgency to modeling you know, good behavior as far as that goes because that tipping point is probably a couple hours shy of what I thought it was gonna be, you know, if I'm being honest. And because a lot of kids and a lot of adults spend so many hours just playing games and going to social media sites and kind of cycling back through. And it's so agitating that there's those diagnoses kind of loom just on the other side of two hours a day. So it's, it's important to, you know, to model good behavior. And again, I think modeling is far more potent than the lecture by a lot. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Thank you. Wow. There's so many things I could talk to you about. I could talk to you about this stuff all day, John. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I wonder if you have, and it's something we don't talk about often, but a little bit about the needs of boys versus the needs of girls. And if you have advice for like fathers and daughters. Yes, 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 yes. So let me start with the last end of that. One of the coolest moments I've ever witnessed, I have a good friend who is the father of four daughters, and he's a guy's guy. He, you know, from, I remember when he had his first child, he's like, okay, we're going to have a boy. This is going to be great. We'll have a boy, and I'll have the boy that I can take to play sports and to do all this guy stuff with. And he ended up having four girls, all amazing kids with really different kind of personalities and affinities and interests and skill sets. And we were over at their house one night when the kids were pretty young. I would say their oldest was probably 11, 10 or 11 at the time. And she asked to be excused from dinner after she was done eating. And he said, wait a minute, come over here. And I was kind of like sick to my stomach, like, oh no, what's this moment going to be? <laughs> and he said, make me a muscle. And she makes a muscle and he feels the muscle for a second. And he goes, mm, I don't know, a couple more green beans, maybe. <laughs> and, and it was so cool because it was like all this messaging that girls get about body image, about being over sexualized. That one moment was such a great message from a dad. Like, you know, food is good for you and it makes you strong and healthy. Mm -hmm. And so he's got an athlete and an actress, and his youngest is probably the smartest person I know. <laughs> and it's amazing that dad moment can be, you know, and it doesn't have to be a lecture on how special or important you are. It can just be that moment of like, you're strong. And I love that about you. You know, like that's the vibe that this dad gives. And I love that when daughters kind of carry that. I think it mitigates a whole lot of minefields going forward because it's, this is the first 
guy, the first man that they know, and he's giving empowering messages with ease, you know, kind of organically empowering messages because he kind of means it when he says like, okay, let's eat a, little, a few more green beans and then you're good. Then you're good to go. Then you're strong. And I love that kind of message. Yeah. And he's just like seeing her humanity, right? It's not absolutely. about like. <laughs> yes. Yes. And so like for both boys and girls, I like that message, this idea that I have faith in you. I believe in you. And we treat everybody with respect. I think about like kind of this, I'm asked a lot about the gender differences in this kind of like moments, kind of politically and culturally. And so a lot of parents were drawn toward telling our kids, you know, this is where we treat everybody with respect. And I like that. I like that idea. I think, you know, every instance of bullying or harassment of any kind is an opportunity to talk to your kids about this stuff because they are hearing it. Even if they're as young as your 10 year old, if they have a screen that they have access to, they know that there is this sexual harassment thing going on and it's too young to know and yet our kids know. So it's important to kind of take a moment and talk with them about that. But I think the message ought to always be one of kind of respect and empowerment and where we are going to make the biggest impact there with our kids is in the word that you used in modeling it for our kids and showing them that for the other parents, for other adults around us and for our kids themselves. And then if we show them that this is how we, treat everybody that we meet, boy, girl, adult, child in the world, kids carry that pretty gracefully. It's kind of funny because the teenagers I work with, they save their worst <laughs> for mom and dad. And, and I get a lot of parental complaints about that. And I usually tell parents, oh, that's not the worst news, that they treat everybody else with respect and they bring their anxiety home. And that's where they vent it instead of venting it all the way out in the world inappropriately. It's not the worst thing to carry it home, and, but, but it's hard. It's hard for parents to kind of deal with that eye roll, you know, <laughs> but, yeah. but if that's safe for home, it's a better story than that happening in math class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I love that message. You know, I have faith in you. I believe in you. And so then I guess when we get to the moments of the eye roll, because I've gotten plenty of the eye roll, sure. then maybe it's about just calming our reactivity, not letting our stuff lead the way and just trying to stay, staying as grounded and curious and being modeling that what we want to see in our kids. And I love you've used the word curious a couple of times. And I think if you, if you're having trouble finding your compass as a parent in a given situation, if you approach it with curiosity, what's this like for my child and, and genuine curiosity, curiosity with no agenda, then you're going to get somewhere. That's a great place to meet your kids, you know, like right in that curious moment. Mm, I love that. I think that's a beautiful place to end with curiosity is a beautiful Excellent. place to end today, John. Where can people find out about you and what, and do you have your own podcast too? So tell them yes. about that. Where can they yeah. find the world? Okay. My website is drjohnduffy.com and, and that's kind of a storefront for everything I've got going. And there's some video on there and my podcast is called Undo Anxiety. You can find that on iTunes or Podbean or WGN Plus. I'm on WGN Radio here in Chicago every other Wednesday at 11 a.m. talking by and large parenting and other mental health issues related to parenting for sure. And yeah, that's about it. But, but if you go to drjohnduffy.com, you'll, you can find everything about me and my book is still available on Amazon. Awesome. John, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to talk to somebody with so much experience and humor and wisdom. And I think that the what you're offering to the world is so valuable that and I'm just grateful that you're here, you're sharing your voice, you stopped going to doing accounting, and <laughs> you are with us sharing this wisdom. It makes a big difference to me and it makes a big difference to a lot of people. I know. So thank you. Thank you, Hunter. It's been a joy to spend an hour with you and that you are clearly a great benefit to your audience and your listeners. And I can't wait. I'm going to listen to more of your podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. I hope that you enjoyed this. I mean, isn't Dr. John amazing? Actually, I'm going to be on his podcast, Undo Anxiety, and that'll be coming up so you can look for that as well. And I love what he says about teenagers. It just gives me a lot of hope. I love this perspective, and I love that idea about 
getting into that more powerful ally position. That is so cool, right? It really makes a lot of sense to me. I wonder if it makes a lot of sense to you too. So if you enjoyed this episode, please do, of course, subscribe and leave a rating that really helps support the podcast a lot. Share it with your friends, all of those things. And then if you want to have more interaction, go deeper to really make this part of your life with practices and teachings that are live. Join us for the Mindful Parenting free live training week, March 5th through 9th, and you can join me in that at mindfulparentingcourse.com slash free training. That's mindfulparentingcourse.com slash free training. And I hope you will be there. Be there and then tag me in the Facebook group and say hi and I'll say hi back. It'll be great. Oh, and the retreat. Of course, if you want to actually say hi in person, I'm willing to bet we still have a space or two left, maybe not so many because it's this retreat will sell out for the spring retreat in Wilmington, Delaware, and it's at the most beautiful place. It's at the Winterthur Country Estates. It's, you drive down this stone gates, down this long drive past a pond over a little stone bridge, and then you get carried by a tram over to this gigantic mansion. We have some rooms in the mansion. And they're beautiful, historic rooms, super cozy. You don't have to bring anything but you and your yoga mat. We've got lunch covered. It is really, truly a day for you to let go of your to-dos and relax and let go. And it can be really life-changing to just have this in-person, deeper experience. And that is, if you want to join me, go ahead and join me. Do that for yourself. You know, you deserve to have some time to get away and you're going to come back renewed and a better parent anyway. And that's at mindfulmamamentor.com slash spring retreat. Or if you just go to Mindful Mama Mentor, you can head over to the events page and find it. But it's at mindfulmamamentor.com slash spring retreat. And I'm so excited to let you know that next week I am coming back with my two of my favorite people in the world. Todd and Kathy Adams from Zen Parenting Radio are going to be on the podcast and they are great teachers of mine. I can't wait to introduce you to them. They have incredible things to say. So I will see you next week. Thanks. Bye-bye. Are you frustrated with parenting? Do you want to practice conscious, compassionate parenting, but you don't know how? It's not easy, and there's no roadmap for this. Until now. I'm Hunter Clark Fields, creator of the Mindful Parenting Course, and I know how frustrating it is because I've been there. I struggled as a young mom, and when I found myself yelling and triggered by my child, I knew there had to be a better way. And there is. Mindful parenting is different from other parenting trainings. They don't tell you that all that good advice is as good as useless when our internal stress response is triggered. Mindful Parenting teaches you research-based tools and practices to reduce your stress response so that you can respond rather than react. And it teaches you exactly what to say that, so that you can create willing cooperation from your child. You can learn more and enroll at mindfulparentingcourse.com. And you can join us for a free live training where you'll learn why your kids don't listen to you, what punishment really teaches, the parenting truth that every pediatrician gets wrong, and the hidden myth that undermines your parenting. Sign up now at mindfulparentingcourse.com slash free training. That's mindfulparentingcourse.com slash free training. I'll see you there.